like that. Some type of sin that's opened the door for them to um, have that as a habitation. That's why it's so important when you move into a home, when you, you know, take over a piece of property to anoint it, to sanctify it, and to set it apart for the Lord's use because it's like you're taking over territory. Does that make sense? Are you guys okay? Okay. All right. So, since the fall of Satan, he has been methodically trying to destroy creation. Okay? So, let's read uh, 1 John 3, 8 again. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning, and for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And in verse 5, you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. Now, let me read you 1 John 3.10 in the least, okay? If you guys have not gotten a copy of this, I don't know what you're waiting for. Weast. W-U-E-S-T. You need to get a copy. Okay, so 1 John 3.10. Actually, I'll probably start with 9. Everyone who has been born out of God with the present result that he is a born one of God does not habitually commit sin. Because his seed remains in him. What's the seed? Jesus Christ. And he is not able habitually to sin because of, out of God he has been born with the present result that he is a born one of God. So you cannot habitually sin if his seed remains in you. So what happens when a person is born again and then it's like all of a sudden they're doing all this sin. Do you do you guys have any ideas? Talk to me. What happens when a person is born again, spirit-filled, and then all of a sudden they start living like a sinner again? But what happens to the seed? It begins to diminish. If you don't feed the seed, if you don't water the seed, if you don't nourish the seed, then the seed begins to diminish. And so what happens is the enemy will then seek to empower the fallen nature and cause them to begin to relate more to the devil than they do to God. And I'll tell you, we're getting to a time where this is getting serious. Sin is serious, but people will lose their salvation. I think we're going to be surprised at how many people, when they get to heaven, Lord, did we not do this in your name? Did we not do that in your name? He says, I don't know you because you habitually practice lawlessness. And some will get to heaven and be surprised that they lost everything. They ain't gained anything except at least they're not going to burn in hell. And so we have to understand that if your seed in you is growing, you will grow in the nature of Jesus Christ. And even if it's a little bit, <laughs> that's good. Just keep making forward progress. Now, the act of practicing righteousness does not come by your willpower. It just doesn't. You do choose, but have y'all ever tried to stop doing something by willpower? Yeah. How successful were you? Listen, we're not very right. I had a, a friend I was talking to today, and she said, I heard the voice of the Lord. Like, you know, it was straight up clear. And I said, oh, well, what did he say? And he said, stop eating gluten, and you'll have a better pregnancy. Straight up. I'm like, amen, sister. Amen. I can relate to that. And uh, so she goes, but I'm nervous. And I said, why? And she said, well, now I have to choose not to eat gluten. And I said, well, I mean, yeah, your choice is involved, but the choice isn't whether you eat it or not. The choice is whether you believe that with the word from the Lord comes supernatural power to do it. That's how that works. Christ, he works both the will and the pleasure in you, okay, to do what he wants you to do. So when the Lord releases a word, he releases a supernatural ability to keep the word. Why? 
Because Christ became one with sin so that we can be the righteousness of God. So a lie from the enemy is that you're not holy, you're not righteous, you always mess up, you're stupid, blah, blah, blah. The reality is you are righteous, you are holy, you are victorious, okay? Those are the realities. So we need to stop listening to the enemy reminding us of our past. You know he'll do that? He will come in and remind you of what you used to do to get you knocked out of the place of victory. When I first got born again, I'm so thankful mom and dad told me this. They said, okay, now that you're born again, all your old friends are going to come out of the woodworks. I'm like, really? Nah. Yep, yep. Sure enough, I heard from people that I used to get stoned with and drink with in an old town that I didn't even live in anymore. I'm like, what? How did they even get my number? I don't even know how they got my number. You know, they call me up, hey, what's going on? I'm not a born again Christian now. I even had one say, well, I am too. So, you want to get together sometime when you're in children's sex and get high? No. I do not want to go and get high in children's Texas. You know, it's just crazy, right? And then I remember when I quit smoking cigarettes. I had a dream that was so vivid that I had a cigarette that I had asked Mike, did I smoke in the last few days? <laughs> and he's like, no. Okay. Have you ever had that happen, though? It's like you have been delivered from something and the enemy just starts throwing your past up in your face trying to get you to do what you used to do. If we don't recognize that he's doing that, we're going to fall, right? So he's sly. He's very sly. He's very cunning. And so if he can't get us to sin, here's another trick he does. I want you guys to look at 2 Corinthians 11.13. So remember that Lucifer is called son of the morning. Now, I love how the Lord takes vengeance because it literally means the Hebrew morning star, okay, which is a term for the sun. And guess what Jesus Christ is called? Morning star. You know, he's punching him right in the face. I love it. I love when the Lord punches the devil in the face. I love when I get the opportunity to punch the devil in the face. Um, I just cracked up because there's the lady out here, uh, real estate stuff for. She goes, I have had, like, oh, I hope she doesn't see this. I have had diarrhea for days. And she's like, You're a wellness coach. Can you help me out? And I'm like, Well, do anything new? You know what's going on? She said, Well, I'm doing a liver cleanse. I was like, That's why a liver cleanse. Oh, my goodness. So I explained to her detoxing and stuff. I said, Just put purification over your liver. You know, it's essential oil. Just put that over your liver, I'll help you out. She said, well, which side is the liver? And I literally am picturing a UFC fight <laughs> where they do the kick and they hit someone and they're like, oh, you know. I said, I think it's the right side. <laughs> and she's like, okay. Anyway, punching, violence, UFC, it all goes together. All right, so what he does is if he cannot get you to sin, he'll get you to become self-righteous and obeying the laws that you have decided you're supposed to obey. All right, so let's look at 2 Corinthians 11, 13. He's called the angel of light. Now let's look at this. It says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. What is light? Revelation. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. Now, just in case you guys don't know, the devil does not come knocking at your door saying, Hello, I'm the devil, and I'm going to try to get you into legalism and self-righteousness. Okay, he doesn't do that, right? So what he'll do is one day you'll be reading the Bible, and you'll see that, you know, uh, not eating certain meats and, uh, you know, not doing this, not doing that. Oh, that's important, you know. And you'll begin to meditate on this, and then you'll start researching things, and you'll find out that health-wise that's a good thing to do. And before you know it, you have made a law that you cannot eat certain meats, right? And what will happen is 
You will not notice that Mark chapter 7, the Lord said it's not what you put in that defiles you, it's what comes out, thus purifying all foods. Okay? And so it appears to be revelation to you. Then you'll be reading the New Testament and you'll see that women should have long hair, dudes should have short hair, uh, women should pray with a covering, you know, whatever, prayer shawl or whatever, and they can't talk in church. Okay? Can't wear makeup. Don't let your outward appearance be, you know, adornment, makeup, and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. The enemy will come to you using the word that appears as revelation to get you into laws mm -hmm. that cause you to think you're all that. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is you actually begin persecuting those that are living by faith. Mm -hmm. That really does confuse me, though, that part of the Bible. Listen to my teaching on women. I go all over that. Okay. All right. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The strength or the supernatural power of sin is the law. When the enemy tries to get you into legalism, he is actually strengthening the sin nature in you, causing you to backslide. In fact, read the book of Galatians because Paul said, if you return to the bondage again, which is the law, that's what he's talking about, you are divorced from Christ. That's what that means. And you've fallen from grace. So no longer does grace teach you to say no to sin. No longer does grace change you and transform you. No longer does grace do its work. Instead, you have fallen from that place, and you've actually positioned, positioned yourself to have the punishment of the Old Testament law on everything that you do not do. That's why it's so dangerous. And that's why all these people that say they're Christians, and you have to call Jesus Yeshua, and you have to observe the Sabbath, you cannot have any unclean meats, all that stuff, that is demonic. Okay? And you can read Timothy. He talks about that. So the enemy comes as an angel of light. Why? Because he was the morning star. And then it also says, this is crazy, his ministers... Have y'all ever thought that Satan has his own ministers? Where do ministers minister? Churches. Right? So you go to church, and it's a great place. Hear the sermon. Okay? And you walk out feeling condemned. Blah. Don't mount up to, you know, the standards. Irritated. Dirtier, yeah. Dirtier than you came. Yeah, feel like you've been slimed. Right? Yeah. Guess what? You've been ministered to by a minister of Satan. And if you think that he doesn't use believers, okay, he does. Because he tries to deceive. And so what will happen is if they repent and they understand, they see, then they'll be set free. I used to, I didn't have candles, I didn't have crosses, I didn't have pork. I didn't have, uh, I, you know, observed the Sabbath and actually turned in my study day, so it's no big deal now. But I did it because the law said to, right? Well, then, when I read Mark 7, and it said that he purified all foods, I'm like, I'm getting some bacon, didn't I? I went to Walmart, and I, got, I bought bacon, and I bought pork, and then we had red lobster. I mean, it was awesome, okay? And I was so set free. It was like, oh, my goodness. And you know what's funny? People don't want to eat bacon, but they'll pig out on muffins and Cokes and all that stuff that actually is worse for your health than any, you know, meat that we try to avoid. Okay? So, his ministers transform themselves. That word transforms means disguise. It's like Halloween. They will look more righteous than anybody else. More pious. Even walk a certain way, all graceful. Have you ever seen that? I remember one time, me and Mike were at a church we used to go to, and the prophet showed up. So we're like in the middle of worship, and it's like all attention focuses on the prophet, and he comes in with his entourage. And I was angry. Do you remember that, Mike? I was ticked because here this is worship for the Lord. And this man comes in and draws attention to himself, and everybody's attention is taken off of God. And later we had the privilege of taking him and his assistant to dinner, and they treated the waitress like crap. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you're not a prophet. Plus, we got an argument over who can prophesy and who can't. But, you know, still, you don't have to treat the waitress like food. And so, 
You have to understand that people that are ministers of the enemy, they will take praise. They will take attention. They will take glory. And I guarantee you, if you don't do it their way, it's the highway. Right? So if you've ever been a part of that, I promise you've encountered someone that has disguised themselves as a minister of righteousness. Today, the enemy's done such a good job. There are entire churches built on the doctrine that there is no hell. I read this book, Love Wins. I remember I cracked up on this one chapter because it said, I shouldn't laugh, because it's a serious thing. Because, you know, if people believe that, they don't get born again, and when they die, they're going to be surprised, right? So it's not a funny thing. But here's how you describe what happened, okay? So when a person that's not born again dies, when they die, their soul goes through this zapper. Literally, I mean, seriously, this zapping thing that zaps all the old nature and sin away so that they can live in heaven. And uh, have you guys heard of Bill O'Reilly? Mm -hmm. He interviewed the dude. Mm -hmm. And he said, so what about Hitler? I don't want to be in heaven with Hitler. <laughs> you might think he's in heaven. He's in hell as far as I'm concerned. Well, you know, he couldn't answer the question. Then he got Franklin Graham on there, mm -hmm. and Franklin Graham said, Hitler's in hell. You know, and if you're not born again, you're going to hell too. And man, he got a lot of flack for it. A lot of flack. There's entire doctrines and churches built on stuff that's not even in the Word. There are entire Jesuses that are not the same Jesus we know that are being preached. How could a God of love send anyone to hell? It is time for Christianity to be restored. It really is. And you know what? I'm not interested in people that have it together. I'm not interested in, you know, professional Christians. I want the tattooed. I want the gauged. I want the rejects. I want the gangsters. I want the addicts. I want the prostitutes. You see what I mean? Because the Lord said that in the end, He's going to go to the professionals. And he's going to say, I'm ready for my marriage supper. Everything's ready. Oh, I don't have time. I can't come to it. I got this obligation, that obligation, blah, blah. So then he tells his servant, he said, go out to the highways and the byways. Find them under the bushes. Get them. Bring them in. And everything was filled by those that society rejected as lost causes. And so he fills his banqueting table. And whenever you went to a wedding in the ancient Middle East, you could not wear your street clothes. And so when you came, you were given a white garment. And so all of those were clothed with righteousness. And this man comes to his wedding, and he's not wearing the robe. And everything went silent. And that man was cast into the uh, outer darkness, gnashing his teeth. He represents the one who says, oh, I don't need that. I'm already righteous. That's who we want. If you want to find the people that want to come into the kingdom, go to those. Okay? I had the opportunity to minister to a lot of recovering addicts and stuff through some work with junctions. Love them. They're not always reliable. <laughs> but they're real. You know what I mean? They're real. And I, I love it. I don't have to put up with any Christianese. You know what I mean? And, and, and they want God. And it's a great opportunity to minister to these people. 1 Timothy 4.1. We're not going to turn there. We're almost done. And I'm going to pray for you guys. But it says, The Spirit expressly or explicitly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith. There will be people that you've gone to church with, that you've been part of prayer groups, and they will depart from the faith. We have to know that. We have to understand that is a reality. The Holy Ghost said it. The Spirit explicitly says in latter times, some will depart from the faith. How? By giving heed or paying attention to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9-10. through 10. Let's read that one. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. Now remember, 
remember sin is lawlessness, lawlessness is sin. And so he's speaking about the Antichrist. And in verse 9, he says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. That's actually supernatural energy, okay? With all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. There are Christians today that are in such a dangerous place because they've not received the love of the truth. And they're being carried away by their sins or being carried away by false doctrine. Now, let me ask you this question. If you can think of one person right now who you know used to be a strong Christian who is not now, and they don't want your truth, they don't have anything to do with it, if a man comes and brings world peace, okay, not only world peace, he's been killed and raised from the dead, and he does signs and wonders, do you think that person is safe? I mean, this is going to be crazy. Who's ever brought world peace? Y'all heard of ISIS, right? Who's going to get them to stop? It has to be a supernatural power, guys. And, and, and even the Lord said, and he would deceive the elect if it was possible. We're the elect. He would deceive even them. But for our sake, he has shortened those days. And so, in Jude, Jude said, you know, I wanted to write to you about our common faith. But listen to this. He says, but men have crept in unnoticed who turned the grace of God into lewdness. What did Paul say? Should we sin so that grace would amount? Certainly not. Jude is talking about the very people that we're talking about. How they've crept into households and they've seduced spouses away from one another. And they've seduced people into believing false doctrine. And they've told you, it's okay, you can sin all you want because God's grace is sufficient. That's the people he's talking about. Lewdness means sexual excess, absence of restraint, unsatiable desire for pleasure, insolence, arrogance, and perversion. And so Paul's question makes sense. How can we who have died this sin live any longer in it? And then he says, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So we're going to really get into baptism next week is actually very fascinating. Um, I think sometimes we can think it's boring because we've heard and seen so many baptisms as believers. But there's a supernatural thing that occurs when you're baptized if you do it by faith. When I was baptized, I truly believed that I would be different after. I was five years old as a believer. I was baptized in Gigi's bathtub. And it was like from that point on, I didn't have, you know, I had struggles. But it was like I, I began to gain traction, if that makes sense. And so the word baptized, because he is speaking of water baptism, in the original Greek means to be fully wet. It's a full immersion. What would happen if someone died and you threw them on the ground and threw their own? Get stanky, huh? Decay, bugs, gross, right? Same thing with water baptism. We're not here to throw a little bit of water. We're here to fully immerse, raise you from the dead, and if you believe that supernaturally, you will walk in newness of life. And you won't fall back into old patterns. Okay, so, Luke 4. I don't have the amplified here. Thanks, my house. Um, but I'm going to read it to you as the amplified would. We've talked a little bit about how the enemy will tempt us to try to get us to fall. But often the, the Lord is showing us how strong we are in Him. And so uh, temptation, if you do it in the power of the Lord, you'll actually come out stronger. And let me prove it to you. Uh, Luke 4.1, I'm going to read this, and then I'll tell you what the Amplified said. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Not the enemy. He was led by the Spirit, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. 
And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. I think um, Luke says it really well, too. All warfare is centered around identity. When the enemy starts coming to tempt you to sin, what he's trying to do is um, uh, make you believe that you are not who you are. And so it says in the least, and Jesus in the control of the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was continually being led by the Spirit in the uninhabited region for 40 days, being out of the city, and he led him to an outjutting cliff of the mountain upon the city which built. Oh, let me make sure. Nope, sorry. Sorry. For 40 days, being constantly put to the test by the devil as he solicited him to sin. Now, let me tell you what this means. For 40 days, demonic beings were constantly tempting the, whole, uh, tempting the Lord, causing him to sin. When he did not, the enemy came at the end and said, in view of the fact that you are the Son of God. That's what it literally says in the Greek. He passed his identity test, and then the enemy said, in view of the fact that you are the Son of God, use your power to turn these stones into bread. Right? So he begins to tempt them. So the Lord says, it is written. Then, in verse... Um, 13. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until a more opportune time that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. He went into temptation filled. He came out with power. So if you're going through a cycle of temptation, if you will hang on to your identity in Christ and you'll stay strong, you'll actually come out with more anointing and more power in the end. Now in verse 13 it says, now when the devil had finished his cycle of temptation in the Amplified, he stood back from afar waiting for a more opportune time. So there are seasons that the enemy tries to attack you. Lawlessness and legalism. So here's what I want you to do when you have that happen. When he tells you that you have to follow certain rules, just laugh at him. When he is tempting you to certain sin, do a hallelujah, Jim, because you're about to walk in more power. You know what I mean? Begin to turn the game on him. Oh, you want to attack me with that sin? Huh. I guess I'm about to go to another level. Thanks for letting me know. I've done that. I've literally laughed at him and said, you just showed me what's coming. Okay? Does anybody have any questions? Or any thoughts? Is anybody in a cycle of temptation they would like prayer? You don't have to tell me what it is. Okay? <laughs> don't, you know. But is there anyone that needs extra strength and extra prayer? You guys are good? Oh my goodness. You're like the most amazing group ever. You guys are. Y'all are amazing. Well, let me pray for you anyway. As we finish this season of warfare, and then we'll take up the offering. And I want to pray for you guys on the offering. The Lord showed me something specific. It'll be real brief. But I want to pray for you guys on something. Father, we thank you for the revelation that the enemy tries to get us into lawlessness or legalism. And so we ask that you give us eyes to see so that when he tries to tempt us into being self-righteous or trying to do things in our own willpower or trying to do things to please you, uh, do works and things like that, Father, we uh, ask that you remind us that the only thing that pleases you is faith. And the only work of God is believing in the one that you sent. Father, we also ask that when he tries to tempt us into sin, that we recognize what's happening and we rejoice that he has overplayed his hand and we're about to operate more power. So Father, I ask that you raise us up as a people that know how to basically box the devil and win in the power of your strength and how to turn the mind games on him. Father, right now, I release everyone in this place into a position of authority and identity, and I ask that you unveil it to them who they are in you 
and who you are in them so that when the enemy comes to attack identity, they can say, that's not who I am. I'm not defeated. I don't have poverty. I'm not sick. My relationships with God and man are secure. And they'll begin to confess the reality of the scriptures. And Father, like today is 822, I ask that the light that you give us be revelation of your word. And that we read it, we take it, and we do it.